Hey guys! So today's Matt Chat is a little bit different. <laughs> and I say Matt Chat as though that's some format that exists on this channel. Really, it just refers to any time that I'm sitting on the couch, I'm talking about important, serious topics. And uh, today is probably the most important and serious of those. You see, earlier today, I was given the chance to interview Dr. Anthony Fauci. He is the director of the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases. Or if you don't really care about that, really, he's the favorite face of science as it relates to everything that's been going on about COVID-19 for the better part of the last year. Dr. Anthony Fauci. 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 Dr. Anthony Fauci, someone you know really well. The allergy part, put that aside. Don't care about that. It's all about the infectious diseases today. Why me, you ask? Why was I the person selected to interview him? Great question. Don't know. Honestly, they just reached out to me and they're like, hey, do you want to talk to this important person who is answering questions about COVID-19? And I'm like, absolutely yes. I'm assuming it's because our channels are mildly educational and aim to bust myths about things in video games, movies, and TV. And so this is all about busting the myths of COVID-19. But you know what? Might not be that. Could be that Dr. Fauci really wanted to know the FNAF timeline or wanted to get real deep into Among Us lore. Maybe it was that. So what you're about to see is our uncut, uncensored interview with Dr. Fauci. He's a busy man, as you can imagine. And so we were only allowed 10 to 15 minutes with him. We tried to get as much valuable information in there as possible for you guys to spread out to others uh, who might be believing misinformation that's been circulating or to answer questions about those of you who are worried about potentially getting a vaccine for yourself. So we tried to cram as much good material in there as possible. So enjoy, and if this is helpful to you at all or you think it could be helpful to those who are also affected by this, please feel free to share. This man, like I said, is the voice of science, up-to-date science of what we know about this disease as it's happening, what we know about the vaccine, as they're coming out and so he is the go-to guy for trustworthy information that I think is pretty valuable nowadays so spread the good word and here's the interview that Steph and I had with Dr. Fauci Dr. Fauci I'm uh I'm Matthew and I'm Stephanie it's great to meet you and we run a uh edutainment channel on YouTube uh so thank you so much for taking the time with us today to talk about COVID, the vaccine, and everything that's been going on in the world. Yeah, we know you have very little time, so we're going to be really rude and jump right into it. <laughs> okay, be rude. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, just right out of the gate, obviously COVID has been a huge headline for the better part of the last year. And in the early days, a lot of things got reported that science has since shown to not be true anymore or the, the knowledge around that topic has changed. And so to start things off, I'd love to just have a minute off the top of your head, what are some of the common myths or misconceptions about COVID that people still believe that you'd like to kind of clear the air on? Well, I think the, the biggest myth is that a substantial proportion, I don't mean majority, but a proportion that's troubling, of people still think this is a hoax and it's fake news and it's not real. That seems astounding to me that even in regions of the country where the hospitals are being overrun by running out of beds with exhausted personnel and people in that region still A, not wearing masks, believe it's a big hoax, believe it's being overplayed and it's fake news. That to me is just, I, you know, in all of the decades that I've been involved in infectious disease work and dealing with outbreaks, I've never seen a dissociation of reality among some people. So to me, that's the biggest myth. The next biggest myth is that masks don't work, so you shouldn't be wearing a mask. Masks absolutely do work. The other myths that are out there are conspiracy theory myths, which are almost laughable, that uh, you know, where where the vaccine is really putting chips in people so that, you know, Bill Gates and I can follow people around and encroach upon their privacy. So it's really you know, it, it sometimes seems funny, but it's sad because we have 352,000 people, 352,000 people in this country have died. We have 3,000 deaths per day. So anything that's a conspiracy theory, uh, um, uh, uh, a claiming of there being a hoax, uh, uh, talking about fake news does nothing but prevent us as a nation from responding in an appropriate way 
to, to stop this historic pandemic, which is nothing like we've seen in literally 102 years. I think that transitions really well, actually, into the next question that we have, which is specifically about um, people who don't believe that the vaccine that's been, or the multiple vaccines that have been developed are safe. Um, we have, you know, people we know, even, you know, some members of our like extended family who are saying, I'm not going to get this vaccine because it hasn't been tested and it's not safe. Um, we would love to hear what you would what you would have us tell to our family who would say that, or um, just to people who don't believe it's safe, how do we know it's safe? Okay, so that's a good question because that is not myth. Those are appropriate questions that people are asking. They're understandable and you, we should never criticize anybody for asking those questions. So the, the two issues that have been on the forefront of things that I've gotten asked is that, boy, you did this really quickly yeah, the, vac the virus was discovered in January of 2020, and you're already giving vaccinations to people in December of 2020. That must have been a rush, and you were cutting corners. Well, the answer to that is true. It is the fastest that has ever been done in history, but the speed relates to the extraordinary scientific advances that have been made in vaccine platform technology and the enormous amount of resources that have been invested in developing and uh, producing doses even before we knew if it worked. So we took a big financial risk. So the speed did not compromise scientific integrity, nor did it compromise safety. The next big question is, how do we know it's safe and effective? Is this the federal government putting something over on us? Or is this the pharmaceutical companies trying to make a lot of money? Well, the answer is <clears throat> the determination of safety and efficacy was made by clinical trials that had thousands and thousands of people, 30,000 people in the Moderna trial, 44,000 people in the Pfizer trial. The decision of whether or not the data prove safety and efficacy is not made by the federal government. It's not made by the pharmaceutical company. It's made by an independent board called the Data and Safety Monitoring Board that looks at the data and in a completely independent way makes a determination if it's safe and effective. Only then does the company then take that data and present it to the FDA. The career scientists at the FDA, not political appointees, but career scientists, they look at the data and then in association with their advisory committee, which is yet again another independent advisory committee, beholden to no one but the general public, they then help make the recommendation of whether you and I should get the vaccine. So the process is both transparent and independent. So although the questions you asked that some of your relatives are asking are appropriate and understandable question. There is an answer to each of those questions. And when you mentioned the size of those clinical trials, how do those compare with other similar clinical trials done in the past? Much, much larger, much larger, because we wanted to get an, uh, an answer quickly. And the more infections there are in the community, which is unfortunate for us, but in some respects, beneficial for a vaccine trial, because the more infections there are, the quicker you get an answer. If there were no infections in the community, it would take years to get an answer. It took like three months to get an answer. And because of that, I think one of the other big concerns that people have had and that you know we'd love to have an answer for is how do you answer the concerns around long-term effects? You know, Is there the possibility of some long-term side effects here that you know, two, three, five years down the line, oops, we made a mistake, but now it's too late. So uh, the situation with long-term uh, um, uh, adverse events, it's almost it literally unheard of in the history of vaccinology to get vaccinated in 1992 and to get an adverse event in 1997. I mean, that just, it doesn't happen. If you look at the situation with the most common types of adverse events, about 90 plus percent of all of them occur within 30 to 45 days 
following the vaccination. And for that reason, the FDA has already baked into the approval process of an emergency use authorization that you have to wait 60 days from the time that the half of the people who were vaccinated got their last dose before you even let it out to other people. So you're already days behind the outer limits of when the overwhelming majority of adverse events historically occur. So the rollout process is happening here in North Carolina. We are still in phase 1A and they're just now moving to phase 1B this week. How are we doing with the rollout process? What's your assessment? And um, do you think it's going to get faster, get slower? What are your thoughts? It's going to get much faster. I mean, if you look at it, I think it's probably unfair. First of all, we, we're not where we want to be. We've got to do better. So in all honesty and humility, we've got to, we've got to say that. However, it almost certainly is going to get much better because if you look at any big program that you start, there are always bumps in the road and hiccups that occur. You superimpose upon that the fact that it was started in the middle of the holiday season. Try to get something done really efficiently between Christmas and New Year's. Doesn't work very well. There were supposed to be 20 million doses that were shipped. 14 million was shipped, and we got to 20 a few days after the first of the year. We've only put into the arms of people 4 million doses. We would have liked to have gotten 20 million doses in. But if you look at the last 72 hours, there have been about 1.5 million doses in the arms of people, which means that there are an average of a half a million a day which if we had done that right from the beginning, we would have been where we want to be. So even though I think there are going to be challenges ahead, I think you have to really assume, and I think reasonably so, that things are going to get much better than they are right now regarding vaccination. How would we best be able to talk to people about, um, you know, okay, you're going to get your vaccination, but you're still going to wear your mask can you talk to us about why that is and how long we should still expect to be wearing masks if we're all getting vaccinated? So the primary endpoint upon which the vaccine was approved, the 94 to 95% efficacy, was based on the prevention of clinically recognizable disease. Namely, did you get any symptoms? You can get infected and get no symptoms. What we haven't proven yet and we hope to within a reasonable period of time, but it has not been proven yet that the vaccine actually prevents you from getting infected. It could prevent you from getting clinically ill and still allow you to have an asymptomatic infection. So since you might have an asymptomatic infection, that's why you need to continue to wear a mask. Also, you may be one of the 5% in which the vaccine was not effective. So that's another reason for wearing a mask. We'll be able to pull back on the stringency of the health care, not the health care, but the public health messages when you get such a large percentage of the population are vaccinated that you have a protection of herd immunity so that the level of vaccine is so low in the community that the risk of your getting infected is very low. We're not there right now. I've been vaccinated, yet there were two to 300,000 cases of COVID in the community yesterday. So there's still a big risk out there. And that's the reason why I still, wherever I go, wear my mask. When it comes to that herd immunity that you talk about, uh, I don't want to be pessimistic, but what if we don't reach that herd immunity status? And what if there are a contingent of people out there who are just like, I'm not going to get the vaccine and we don't reach that status is, what do we do? <laughs> well, you would still, if you get a substantial proportion, but not the 70 to 85% that I talk about, you would still have a major impact on bringing down the level of infection. Herd immunity means that there is so much immunity that there's almost no virus. So instead of getting it and smashing the virus with the herd immunity, you're going to get a level of virus that's much lower than it is now, but not as low as you want it. 
our age group has a lot of, you know, women who are thinking of becoming pregnant uh, or, or you small know, children or have small children and they're they're concerned about their health. Yeah, We have a two year old, but there are no studies for kids. Are there are there, is there a timeline for studies on pregnant people and children? Or are there any recommendations there? There are no data yet. And the reason there are not is that pregnant women and children are vulnerable populations. And when you're dealing with a vulnerable population, you've got to be very sure that the product, in this case, the vaccine, is both safe and effective in a normal adult population. Once you show that, after a few months go by and we know there's no unexpected uh, issues, then you do a phase one and a phase two A trial in children as well as in pregnant women and prove that it's safe and prove that it induces the same kind of response that you know protects non-pregnant adults. Once you show that, then the FDA can, by bridging those two studies together, can approve it for children and approve it for pregnant women. Makes sense. Great. And then the, the last thing, because I know we're coming up on your time here, the last thing I just wanted to ask is, you know, obviously you are a person who is in high demand and, and in very high stress situations right now. So how do you de-stress over the last year? What have you been doing when you're not on camera around the clock answering these questions? <laughs> well, it's been a very unusual year because I have not had a day off since January 15th. And that includes every Saturday and Sunday. And I average about 18 hours a day. So I don't really have time to unstress. But the one thing I do is every night I run with my wife about three miles, four miles. So sometime tonight around 8, 830, there are going to be two people running in the dark around northwest Washington, D.C., and that happens to be me and my wife. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that you at least are able to carve off a little bit of time for yeah. yourself. Well, Th thank you so much for everything. We really appreciate you carving off a little bit of that time for us, and uh, enjoy your run tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome, Matt, Stephanie. Nice to be with you. Yeah, nice, nice meeting, meeting you. you.